As I stand before this wonderful audience for a few moments to <clears throat> take of your valuable time, I have no greater desire than that that beautiful prayer in my behalf uttered by Dean Bateman <clears throat> may be realized. Now, President Oaks has indicated that many of you, that this is the first devotional for the season, and therefore, many of you are probably here for the first time. And I want to bear you my testimony that I don't think there's anywhere in this world that you could spend the next few years of your lives to better advantage. And if you take advantage of what you get here, it'll change your lives and prepare you not only to be successful in the battle of life, but to help build the kingdom of God in the earth. The graduates from this institution are felt all over the world and the leadership that they are giving. Now, I imagine that when your parents helped you to decide to come here, that they were not only interested in your academic achievements and accomplishments, although President Oaks has pointed out that that's your first responsibility is to get an education, but they wanted you to be able to associate with other young men and young women of your own standards and your own faith. And this group here today represents some of the choice young people of the church from all over the entire world. And then there are other fringe benefits that you get while attending here that will help to change your life. One of them, of course, is that many of you will find your mates here at this school. Now, that isn't what you come for, of course, but that'll be one of the natural uh, fringe benefits. I have a friend, a retired state president, who sent nine children here to this great institution, and all nine of them found their companions here. That's a record. I hope you do that well. <laughs> Some, when I traveled through the church holding conferences, and I just got home yesterday from Hawaii, and I stay in the homes of the state presidents everywhere I go, you'd be surprised how many of them have found their companions here in this great university. And it has been a marvelous thing, and it increases our appreciation as the leaders of the church in the faith of the saints that provides the means through their faithful tithes and offerings to make the operation of this wonderful university and the building of this marvelous campus a reality that so many of our young people can enjoy the blessings thereof. Now, um, see where I want to go from there. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to say to the young women, you have to be a little more careful on the men who you associate with. This will be that you'll be the, well, the most wonderful group of young men in all the world outside of a Mormon institution, but they're not all wonderful. So you have to be careful in the companionship that you see. Here a short time ago, Sister Richards and I were down in California, and we went to a Relief Society Bazaar down there. You've heard about them. And we met a young lady there who was the daughter of one of the families that lived in the state when I was state president down there. And she came up here to the Y and she met a young man who was a member of the church, and she started keeping company with him, and finally he became serious, and uh, when he proposed, oh, well, he was not active in the church, and when he proposed to her, she said, I'll never marry a man who doesn't do his duty in the church and honor his priesthood. She said, I'm going to be able to point to my children and say, you follow your father. My, I like a girl like that that has that kind of courage. <laughs> well, he wasn't willing to pay the price. 
So their courtship ended right there. In a short time, she started keeping company with another young man, and finally their engagement was announced in the newspaper, and a friend of this first suitor sent a copy to him. He was then living back in Chicago, and when he read it, he called her up all the way to Los Angeles. That was before we had these cheap rates. And he said, <laughs> I can't live without you. He said, if you'll call off that engagement and give me another chance, he said, I'll do anything and everything you ever asked me to do in the church. And when I met them down there, he was a counselor to the bishop. And I checked on him later with his stake president. Oh, he said he's now the bishop, and he's the best bishop we have in our state. And here a short time ago, I met him up here in Salt Lake out in front of the Hotel Utah. He'd just been appointed a member of the stake presidency. Now that's the kind of a woman that you ought to be so that you'll bring him up standing if they don't do what they should do. There isn't anything more important to the success in your lives than that you be united in spiritual things in your home. Remember what President McKay and others of the brethren have said, that no success in life can compensate for failure in the home. And if the home is not going to fail, the most important thing is that the, man, the husband and the wife are united in spiritual things. Some time back, a young man called me one night, and he said, are you Bishop Richards? And I said, yes, sir, I'm still a bishop. He said, well, I'm in trouble. I said, what's your trouble? Well, he said, I've been keeping company with a girl for three years, and she heard you preach the other night, and now she won't go out with me anymore. <laughs> I said, why won't she? And he said, because I'm not active in the church. I said, good for her. <laughs> I'm glad to know that there's at least one girl in all Israel who listened to an old man like me. Now, what are you going to do about it? He says, what can I do? I said, get active in the church and then go back and, and, uh, and, uh, and court her. And he said, how can I? I said, you go and talk to your bishop. And if he doesn't help you, you come back to me and I will. He's never been back. So I reckon he went to the bishop. Now, we can do a lot if we'll just make sure that we build the right kind of a foundation, lay a right kind of a foundation to build our lives on. I've always liked the little story about when they built that Salt Lake temple up there. Uh, we're told that the foundations are 16 feet wide. And one day, President Brigham Young came and saw the workmen throwing in chipped granite. And he made them take it out and put in those great granite block with this blocks. With this explanation, we're building this temple to stand through the millennium. Now, you young people are going to build your homes to stand through the millennium, and that's a long, long time. I'm sure you don't know how long it is, but I have a little pet story to give you something to think about. If my wife were here, I wouldn't dare tell you it because she doesn't like it. <laughs> but when we'd been married 35 years, I said, Mommy, what do you think we'll be doing in 35 million years from today? She said, where did you get that crazy idea? She said, it makes me tired to think of it. <laughs> well, I said, you believe in eternal life, don't you? And uh, as I said in the Book of Mormon, we're told that time is measured only to man, that with God, there isn't such a thing as time. It's one eternal round. And the prophet Joseph illustrated it by taking a ring. He said, when you cut it, there's a beginning, and then there's an end. As long as you don't cut it, there's no beginning and there's no end. I said, now, Mother, if you believe that, you and I ought to be pretty well acquainted with each other in 35 million years from today. <laughs> well, now, if you just think of that, then you can understand what Cicero meant when he said 
that he was much more interested in the long hereafter than in the brief present. And so, while you're in the brief present, at presence is the time to lay the foundation upon you which you can build a happy long hereafter. And this institution will go a long way in helping you to do that. Now, when I was president of the Southern States Mission, we converted a lovely school teacher and, uh, down in Florida. And at the close of one of our conferences, she came up to me and she said, President Richards, I'm going to get married. What do you think of that? Oh, I said, I think it's wonderful. I said, do I know him? And she said, no. I said, is he a member of the church? And she said, no. I didn't dare tell her she couldn't marry out of the church down there because I didn't know where she'd find a man in the church except our Mormon elders, and we had hands-off signs hanging all over them. <laughs> Well, I said, now you're a beautiful, sweet, clean, lovely Mormon girl, and you could never be happy with an unclean man. And in your association with him, you'll know whether he's clean or not, or whether he'd take advantage of you if you'd permit him. I said, and then he must be a prayerful man, because as wicked as the world is today, I wouldn't trust any man to be true to his wife and children if he doesn't believe that there's a God and someday he'll have to answer to him for his life here upon this earth. And then I said, he must be willing to let you raise your children in the church because knowing as you do that the God of heaven has restored his truth to the earth, you'd be a very unhappy woman if you had children and you couldn't teach them the gospel. I said, if he measures up, let me know when he joins the church. I didn't see her for about four months. We had another conference. Her train was late coming, and after the meeting, she came along the aisle. I could see she was headed for me. So I went down. I said, name, please. Oh, I'm still Miss So-and-so. I said, what became of the marriage? He didn't come up to your specifications. Now, that's the way, I mean, you could judge before you get the uh, married, that you're laying the right kind of a foundation. I told that little story over in Alabama a short time after that, and at the close of the meeting, a little 17-year-old Mormon girl came up to me, they marry young down there, and she said, President Richards, if I'd have heard that story six months ago, I'd have been an unmarried woman today. Didn't take that little girl very long to find out that you can't find happiness with an unclean man. Well, now, there are some of the fringe benefits that you could keep in mind here in this institution. institution. Now, another is that it will help you to understand the gospel, why you're here, where you came from, and where you're going. Like Jesus said, for what should it profit a man, though he gained the whole world, and lose his own soul. Now, the whole world is a lot, isn't it? But the soul is the one that lives on for those 35 million years. And so, the blessing that will give us a preferred place through that long period is the most important thing in our lives. Now, um, the, the gospel uh, in this institution, you study religion in your classes, and the, even the non-members study religion in their classes, and we welcome them here. We know we have the truth, and we just like to divide it with them. To illustrate what I'm trying to tell you, here some time ago, I had a letter from one of the faculty members down here, and he sent me a, a, a letter, and this is the story. He had a young man in his class who wasn't a member of the church, and this young man didn't want to study religion. He didn't want to have to study uh, religion in that class. So the professor told him that he handed him a copy of the missionary book that I wrote called A Marvelous Work and a Wonder. And he said, if you'll read that and give me a book report on it, I'll excuse you from any other study. 
and he sent me the letter that this boy had written when he was about halfway through the book. And not only that, but the final is, he joined the church, and I had the privilege of performing the marriage ceremony for him and one of our Mormon girls in the Salt Lake, Temp Salt Lake Temple. Now, we have a great message to tell the world, and um, we have to <clears throat> we have to live it, and then we have to tell it too. Now, if you're interested in uh, in history and in geography, just think what you can get out of the Book of Mormon. And the Book of Mormon is the most tangible evidence that we have the truth, for no man could have written that in the time that it was written, except the story of the prophet Joseph be a true story. Just imagine what that book has to tell us about America. If you go back to the words of Jacob and, Abraham and uh, Moses, Joseph, who was sold into Egypt, was promised a new land in the utmost bounds of the everlasting hills. Nobody in this world outside of this church can tell you where that new land is. And yet Moses, in describing that land, uses the word precious five times in just three little verses in the Bible. A precious land. And then when we read the history of how Lehi and his people came here, how they were told that it was a land choice above all other lands, repeated over and over again in the scriptures. Now, from a historical standpoint, it ought to be worth somebody, it is worth something to people to know something about this land that goes back beyond the time that, they were, that the pilgrims came here to the land of America or when Columbus discovered it. Now, that, that, that knowledge that we get through the Book of Mormon is a, is a knowledge that they can't get any other way in all this world. And so, it not only tells us of the great destiny of this land of America, the Lord through his prophets have indicated that it would be a land choice above all other lands, and that it would be the land upon which God would build his new Jerusalem in the latter days, and that it was hid away from the eyes of the world that it might not be overrun, and that, and that the Spirit of the Lord moved upon a man across the great waters to come here, and we understand and know that that was Columbus. Well, you see what a marvelous thing it is to have that understanding. While I was president of the Southern States Mission, an article appeared uh, from the, um, oh, what do you call the, the, um, in the newspaper, what's the one that? Am I getting old? I'm being stuff. I'll tell you that in a minute. <laughs> From the Associated Press, that's what I wanted. I got it. <laughs> Told about a man who came here to the United States from Lima, Peru. His name was William A. Kennedy, and I read that article and I copied it. I have a, a, I copied it in the book, the marvelous work and the wonder that I wrote. But he came here for the purpose of raising money to establish a school or a, or a, a, a seminary down in Lima, Peru, to study the early inhabitants of this land of America, dealing particularly with the Inca and Mayan civilizations. And that article said that he had collected enough money here that when matched by the small American countries, he'd have $30 million. And the article said that former President Herbert Hoover had agreed to serve on that board. And then it indicated that the promises he had was that within 10 years, that sum would increase to 60 to $70 million. I've never heard what actually became of that but I said to myself when I read that article, just think, they're willing to spend 60 to $70 million to learn something about the past history of this great land of America. And after they've spent that amount of money, they'll never know one hundredth part as much as they can know if they'd read the Book of Mormon. 
They may find a few hieroglyphics or uh, pots and pans and so forth, but they'll never know what the God of heaven had in mind when he led the descendants of Joseph here to this land. And so, you see, it's a historical thing, and not only that, but from a ge geogra geographical standpoint, we know the history of this great land of America as no other people in all the world know it. Now, that's only one of the great contributions that this uh, uh, book that you learn here in your schoolwork. Now, we have truths revealed that no other people in all the world have. If you just think of the uh, vision of the prophet Joseph Smith, he didn't know which church to join. That was a reasonable condition. And he read the words in the scriptures, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. And he went out in the woods and prayed, and a light appeared from heaven brighter than the noonday sun. In the midst of that light was the Father and the Son, and the Father pointing to the Son said, this is my beloved Son, hear him. No event has transpired in this world since the resurrection of the Savior of the world to compare with that. Why didn't it happen 500 years ago? Because the Lord hadn't prepared this land for the restoration of the gospel. And that boy Joseph Smith was in waiting for many, many years. If you read and study the scriptures, you'll learn that prophets were ordained prophets even before they came into the world. You remember Jeremiah, when he was called to be a prophet, he couldn't understand it. And the Lord said, Before thou wast born, I knew thee. Before thou wast conceived in thy mother's womb, I ordained thee to be a prophet unto the nations. Well, now, in that same sense, Joseph Smith was ordained to be a prophet long before he came here upon this earth. When you read in the Book of Mormon, you read the account of Lehi in the desert when he told his son Joseph that the Lord had promised Joseph, who was sold into Egypt, that in the latter days he would raise up a prophet from his loins like unto Moses. And we read in the Bible that there was no prophet in Israel like unto Moses because he talked with God face to face. That's the kind of a prophet the Lord said he would raise up in the latter days from the loins of Joseph. Now, obviously, that prophet was the prophet Joseph Smith. That promise, you see, was made to Joseph over 3,000 years ago, but the Lord had him in waiting for this, the dispensation of the fullness of times. And then Lehi said that he would bring forth the, the word of the Lord. He brought us the Book of Mormon. He brought us the Doctrine and Covenants. He brought us the Pearl of Great Price and many other wonderful writings. He has given us more revealed truth than any prophet who's ever lived upon the face of the earth as far as the history and the records show. And then he said, He shall not only bring forth my word, but he shall bring men to conviction of my word that's already gone forth among them. What did he mean by that? He'd give them to understand the Bible so that they would understand it in the spirit in which it's written. You realize that in this nation we had, I checked over a year ago, 697 different churches just in America, just because men couldn't agree in their interpretation and they were dependent upon their own wisdom. And so the Lord said this prophet should not only bring forth his word, but would bring men to conviction of his word that had already gone forth among them. And then he adds, and he shall bring men unto salvation. Why? Because he would be the recipient of the restoration of the holy priesthood, the power to administer the saving ordinances of the gospel. And then he adds, and he shall be great in mine eyes. Whatever the world may think of the prophet of this dispensation, there is the word of the Lord, he shall be great in mine eyes. Now to illustrate what he meant when he said, he shall not only bring forth my word, but shall bring men to conviction of my word that has already gone forth among them. I'd like to tell you a little experience I had 
when I was on a mission over in Holland. I was invited to talk to a Bible class of businessmen in The Hague. We met in the home of a prominent furniture dealer. There were about 20 men. The only woman there was the daughter of the man of the house. And each had his Bible. And they gave me an hour and a half to discuss universal salvation, which includes our work for the dead. And I just gave them chapter and verse, an explanation, and let them look it up in their own Bibles and read it. They believe it more when they read it themselves. And then when I was through, I closed my Bible, laid it on the table, folded my arms, and waited for a comment. The first comment came from the daughter of the man of the house. She said, Father, I just can't understand it. She said, I've never attended one of these Bible classes in my life, that you haven't had the last word to say on everything. And tonight, you haven't said a word. He says, my daughter, there isn't anything to say. He said, this man is, has been teaching us things we've never heard of and been teaching them to us out of our own Bibles. That's what the Lord meant when he said that this prophet of this dispensation should not only bring forth his word, but would bring men to conviction of his word that had already gone forth among them. Now, I could tell you many more stories like that. A few years ago, two of our churches on the West Coast were holding a convention in Salt Lake. And the leader of the group, and that included from California, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Utah, Nevada, the Congregational and the Evangelical Churches, and the leader of that group wrote a letter to President McKay and asked him if he would send one of the general authorities to talk for two hours in the morning session of their convention and tell them the story of Mormonism and then to remain for an hour and a half and let them ask questions. Oh, to remain as their guests for lunch and then to remain for an hour and a half in the afternoon and let them ask questions. Well, I got the... Um, assignment, and, and I don't mind telling you, I was glad to get it. I, I tell our missionaries, you never need to argue with anybody, just learn how to tell our story. You tell them things they've never heard of, and you prove them to them out of their own Bibles. So I said, now do you want it just the way we believe it, how we got the church and what we believe? The man in charge said, that's just what we want. I took some of them on to get away on earlier planes, so they set the luncheon back a half an hour and gave me two hours and a half in that morning session. And um, uh, I just gave them chapter and verse and showed them what we got by the restoration. You remember the words of Peter when he said the heavens were to receive the Christ until the restitution of all things spoken for the mouths of all the holy prophets since the world began. A restitution is not a reformation. That's where all these other churches come into existence. They've tried to correct the mistakes of history, and we have a restitution. And so I showed what we got by the coming of the different, different holy prophets, as Peter said. And when I was through, I closed my book, and I... I only had one question out of all those ministers and church leaders, and you might be interested in that question. The man in charge said, now, Mr. Richards, you've told us that you believe that God is a personal God. I said, that's right. He said, we've heard it said that you believe that God has a wife. Would you explain that to us? You know, I think he had thought he had me in a corner and I couldn't do it. So rather facetiously, I said, well, I don't see how in the world he could have a son without a wife, you. And they all began to twitter. <laughs> and I didn't have any trouble with that question. Now, uh, I see it's time to close in a few minutes. Well, I add one more thought now. When they bring the, when I go to conferences, at the close of the conference, the saints always bring up their non-member friends and introduce them to me, and I say this. Do you know what I always say to the non-members who honor us with their presence? What's that, Mr. Richard? There are only two kind of people in this world. There are those who are in the true church and those who ought to be. 
and get your boots on. We don't want to wait too long for you. We'll get you sooner or later. You don't know that, but we do. And I said, it'd just as well be sooner as later. Do you know I've had letters come back from all over the world telling me they got their boots on. I walked up to the counter in the United Airlines in Chicago here about a year and a half ago, and the young man back the counter looked and he says, aren't you LeGrand Richards? I said, yes, sir. He said, I'm one of those guys you told to get my boots on. He said, I have since joined the church and I'm going out to the Y next fall. Last uh, general conference, a woman came in from California. She'd made a, me a pretty little figurine with two boots and a little uh, motto in the middle, get your boots on, that I could put on my death. Here, just the other day, I received a letter from a young man dated August the 24th. Now, that's not very long ago. Here, about a year ago, I entertained a young group from the y, my office, and I showed them through the administration building, and as I did, I said, I'm sure you're all Mormons. If you're not, you ought to be. So in this letter, he wrote me back and he said, I was the only ought to be in that group that you showed around. And uh, he said, now I just wanted to tell you that I've joined the church. Now I say, there isn't an honest man or honest woman in this world who really loves the Lord and would take time to study it, who wouldn't join this church if they would do it and in the spirit of prayer. Now God bless you all and keep you young people as in the hollow of his hand from all the wickednesses of the world and the false philosophies of men that you may learn what life really is for and that you be mighty instruments in his hands in helping to establish his kingdom. And I leave my love and blessing with each one of you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.